here today. This is our first one, and we hope to do this every year. So please spread the word if you enjoyed yourself and you learned some stuff. Um, our first guest is Beth Olson. She's an associate professor at the College of Egg and Life Sciences in Nutritional Sciences. Oh, she's right behind me. Um, and uh, she comes from Oak Creek. Yes. Do you live there now? No, I live in Mass. You live in Mass. Okay, great. Um, so she's worked in the community-based nutrition research and programs for 25 years, starting in positions with the Kellogg Company in research and development and marketing. So now she's working at UW-Madison. She does research and outreach to help individuals and families make the healthiest possible choices in nutrition and health. So she's going to talk to us. Do you want to take questions after or during? Either works. Okay, so if you have a question about anything, you're confused, raise your hand and she will help you. Um, you may have heard her. She has also been on Wisconsin Public Radio a number of times. So, there you go. Many not. You know, we can't control what the genes we got from our 
parents. We often can't control our environment, the air we're breathing, the water we're drinking sometimes has health consequences. But there's other things maybe we can, with information, with support, with help, with extension programs, things like sleeping, activity, what we're eating, um, those kind of things. But it's why it makes it um, hard to have a magic bullet. So when you see the magic bullet, you know, be aware, it's probably, what do they call it, the beans, Jack and the Beanstalk, the magic beans, it's not, it's not real. So I also did realize as I went back through my notes again yesterday to put some um, talking points down that it, it might be a little science -y. As Jill knows, I mean, I'm just, I'm kind of a scientist at heart. My background actually was a degree, my undergraduate degree here at, was at Madison in biochemistry. So that's kind of where I came from. But sometimes I also think understanding a little of it helps us make sense of what people are telling us. So hopefully that will, um, help today. Um, so I'm going to talk today about the macronutrients, not the micronutrients. Macronutrients being the ones that give us energy, calories, carbohydrates, proteins, fats. Um, sometimes people call water a macronutrient because of the quantities. It doesn't provide energy. And of course, alcohol pro unfortunately provides energy, sometimes that we don't need. But as, you know, as much as we think it's essential, it's so we're not going to talk about that today. Um, so, starting with the macronutrients, and then again, I meant to say, setting aside the micronutrients, if you have questions at the end, I can try to cover that. It's another whole field, you know, the B vitamin C, D, where should we be getting it from? But in terms of carbohydrates, they are our main source of energy. We need blood glucose for our brain. You know, if you get lightheaded because you have eaten, it's because you're not getting enough energy. We store it as glycogen in our muscles and in our liver. Very limited storage, though. That's why someone, for instance, with diabetes who's not handling glucose well can't just keep going. They don't have a lot of storage. Um, if you, I, I'm a cyclist, you know, when you get out there and you go hard, you're relying a lot on glucose, and it will run out. And so that's, um, it's our first energy that we, our bodies prefer, prefer to use. It's four calories a gram kind of a techie thing, but just to note that it's the same as protein, but uh, fat is a fair bit more. So proteins are most of our cell structure. Um, they're enzymes that run our bodies. So you might think about, I, I was thinking last night, what's a good analogy, and I started to get myself in trouble, but thinking like maybe the spark plug in a car. You can have fuel, but you need something to kind of catalyze things. It's, they're like catalysts in our body to help things run. We again have very limited storage. Most of our protein is in our cells, it's in our muscles, but we need it. That's not storage. You will um, break it down eventually for energy. If, if, so when you see pictures of, of someone who is starving or someone who's wasting for some reason for a disease, they'll look just like their weight likes to call it wasting away. And it's because they are breaking down their, their muscle. Um, so it's our kind of our last source of energy. It's so important, we need it, there's not storage. If our body can use something else first, it will. Protein's not, you know, a, for our body, very efficient for energy. Then there's fat. <laughs> I don't know if it has a lot of purposes, I realized, when I wrote about. So insulation and cushion, you know, um, as my grandparents got older and now my mother is 90, um, and has lost a lot of her body mass. She's, you know, it's the middle of summer and she's got a coat on or, you know, she's cold because she's missing some of her insulation um, as she's gotten older. It makes hormones and sterols, you know, women, hormones are, sorry, sperm men as well. The hormones are important, but fat, it makes hormones, it makes vitamin D is a kind of a steroid type hormone, vitamin, um, that's a type of a fat. We need it to digest and transport our, the fat around our body. It is, um, after carbs, that's where we go. So when you kind of start to run low on your blood glucose, you'll start to mobilize your fat. Um, it is almost unlimited storage. So it's meant for us to store for the bad times. You know, where you put a little fat on and then you know, this is what I think about with my mother, you know, eat a little bit more, mom, go ahead, because she'll, you know, she'll be sick sometimes she won't be able to eat, and then she has that storage to help her through. So this is um, in the, the RDAs. People have heard of those. The federal government has an agent, has a, a scientific body that advises us, that tells us 
um, how much of different nutrients we should get. And we're, I think we're more familiar, like on the side of the food label, we'll tell you how much of a daily value of vitamin C this product has. That's based on our quarter, it's called RDAs. But also that same group puts up um, an, what they call an acceptable distribution range. So it's, this isn't a recommended amount. It's, this is what's safe for everybody and would meet your needs in terms of energy, protein, fat, and carbohydrates. So the reason I put it up is, so you could get a sense of, they're saying as a percent of our calories, which isn't up there and should be, sorry, protein can make up between 10 and 35 percent of our calories, and that's considered healthy. In, in that range would, would be fine. Fat, 20 to 35, and then you see carbohydrate, which we often just get by difference. But you can see for women, we typically get 15% of our protein from, uh, or 15% of our calories from protein. So we're not, you know, sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, Americans, you know, we have meat, we eat so much protein, way more protein than we need. We, we probably eat more than our base requirement. You see, it's 10 and we're at 15. But we're not eating so much that we are, you know, so out of line with what's acceptable. I also bring that up because in many talks, people are interested in diets, like high protein diets. So often those high protein diets aren't that high, they're just higher than what we normally eat. And they, you know, for some people serve some purpose. I actually, I'm going to just go ahead and say it because I am um, of an age where I'm concerned about, for instance, maintaining my muscle mass. And as we get older, it is a little difficult <coughs> to form new muscle and having a higher amount of protein in our meals and a higher quality of protein helps us kind of get over a hurdle we've developed as we got older of getting um, protein into our muscles. So I'm not out promoting protein, but I just sometimes feel like we don't, it's, it's a macronutrient we don't understand very well. So, um, the cartoon says, I can't tell you the meaning of life, but I can tell, I just came up here to avoid the carbs. So, just a kind of a reminder that, you know, we've also quite demonized um, the carbs that we that we eat, and I think, again, that's just something that we don't understand enough about, um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Simple, I break down carbs this way, simple sugar, starch, and fiber. Simple are just small, that's what they mean, um, and they're in, they're naturally occurring milk, lactose is a simple sugar in milk, fruit, fructose, simple sugar and fruit, um, provides energy, great for us. There's also added, of course, you know, candy bars, sugar is going to be added in there for some other sources. Also, some of our foods that we think of, you know, just as whole foods, do have some sugar added in. So, like uh, canned fruit that has heavy syrup, that would be added sugars. Starch are the more complex. So, you know, when I was growing up, um, and we, there were five of us in Oak Creek, not a lot of money, um, you know, my parents working hard. Starch was what my mom, you know, used for us for our calories, because it was blessed potatoes, rice, you know, she also grew up on a farm in northern Wisconsin, a lot of potatoes. You know, it's, it's, um, it can be a lot of calories if you're not careful, it's very filling, but it's also for us, and in other areas of the world, a really important source of carbohydrates, which can be really problematic in um, times of natural disaster. And then I had to talk about fiber. I, the talks that I do for Strong Bodies on Nutrition, I tell them there is not a topic you can ask me to talk about that I can't work fiber into. <laughs> because uh, my original training in my PhD was around the importance of dietary fiber in terms of um, lipid metabolism. And I just think it's so important and such an underappreciated um, component. Nobody wants to really talk about fiber and where it is. So I will cover that a little bit today a little bit further on in the uh, talk, I believe. Um, so in the added sugars, um, these are just recommendations. I don't think they're particularly important for you to know the amounts. But it's just to show you that people have started to make recommendations, or the World Health Organization has been doing it a long time, um, for how much added sugars. I don't think added sugars themselves are the issue. I think what's, what's the problem is what they're pushing out of the rest of our diet. So if you're consuming a lot of added sugar, soda pops and candies and um, my mom's apple pie um, in, in too much, it pushes out other calories. It could be that there are some people having trouble handling sugar in their body. Metabolically, they are different. But I don't think it's just that added sugar um, because 
chemically they're not any different from really from naturally occurring. But um, someone I worked with years ago in the food industry said, you know, it's not sugars, it's the company they keep. So when you think about a soda pop, it's not, um, it's not really the sugar in that. It's that there's nothing else in there with it. When you think about the sugar in an apple, there's a lot of other nutrients in there. So if that helps in terms of picking foods, I'll let her know. <laughs> that was important. And because um, when scientists kind of look at people's diets over time, they do see when somebody has a lot of added sugars in their diet, they're at risk of um, some chronic diseases. But is it because of those sugars, as I was saying, or is it because people that are consuming, you know, fewer added sugars are also consuming maybe fewer calories, or they're having fewer processed foods, or they have more levels of fiber in their diet. So I think there are many other things that contribute to diets when they are high in sugars that maybe are the reason for their association. But I did um, bring this from the Dietary Guidelines Committee just so you can get an idea of where sugars are coming from. And maybe in part due to my age, I can't really see that. Um, so as you can see, this is one and above. It would be different for adults. They tend to have a little bit lower sugar intake. The older we get, actually, the less we tend to consume from um, added sugars. But sugar sweetened beverages, desserts, and sweets. Um, the reason I do this, and years ago when I worked at Kellogg, before the Dietary Guidelines did this, um, there was another agency that used to do more in putting together, you know, they gather dietary data across the U.S. and we'll put together tables, is we often think about a food having something, and we don't think about how much of that we consume. So, you know, you get this, well, um, this, this food is a good source of vitamin C, but then when you look at the food, people don't eat very much of it. So in the population, it's really not that good of a source. And so that's how you end up with some of these things like sandwiches, you know, being a big pork. Like, well, why would sandwiches be, be, you know, have a big, that big a bubble on added sugars? And it's the other things, you know, ketchup or bread. And then it's the volume. We eat a lot of sandwiches, we eat a lot of bread, we eat a lot of burgers. So the things that add up start to contribute. So for an individual, you have to think, are those things I eat or not? But when we're looking at a population level, like an extension where we're trying to give advice, we also have to think, you know, like, is, so I often get, if you pulled out ketchup separately, it's like condiments, it's not a big source of sugar. But often you'll hear people kind of get on their, in my opinion, I'm on a soapbox, I feel like, get on their soapbox, you know they add sugar and ketchup. And I just think, that's not it why people have a lot of sugar in their diet. It's not the ketchup. I mean, if you eat that much ketchup, you're probably eating too many hot dogs or something. But I think it's really more to do with, you know, the bigger categories. And that's why we often look at it this way. It's why I'm always interested in looking at it that way. Okay, I did get in my fiber um, spiel here. So on our labels on our food, we see soluble and insoluble, insoluble fiber, fiber labeled. We should get both. Um, I worked in fiber decades ago, and I remember my major professor saying, I hate those words, because soluble fiber is not soluble. You know, it doesn't dissolve in water or anything. It's viscous. So if any of you have ever used something like Metamucil, where you stir it into water and it's kind of thick, that's what the viscous means about soluble fiber. And it lends some of its benefits, slowing kind of stomach emptying, kind of regulating our nutrient absorption, slowing it down a little bit. It's because of that viscosity. Whereas insoluble, bad, um, not viscous, is, um, and foods that it's in, as you can see, more like wheat versus the other psyllium, oatmeal, um, beans, lentils, that insoluble um, tends to trap water and create bulk. So um, they, just, they both help in digestion and absorption. They're both associated with reduction of chronic disease for many reasons, perhaps because of the foods they're in and with the nutrients they bring. But I also would point out, generally, no fiber is one or the no food is one or the other. They're a mix of them. We just kind of categorize those with more soluble or viscous into one category and those in the other. But I would say, if you were going to focus on something in your diet, this is one you want to look at. And this is why. So recommendations for men, 30 to 38 <coughs> grams, women to 20 to 25. But you can see how we're doing. For instance, as women, it's 15.5 grams. This, um, I didn't change these data. I went back to see if there was something more current. We had in gathering data um, 
across the U.S. You might have seen a headline, I think it was in yesterday's paper about the Census Bureau. Um, during COVID, we had a big delay. We couldn't go out and gather data, and also analysis slowed up. And so a lot of our data, until recently, kind of ended in 2019. So they have updated this now. It's now N. Haynes is a, uh, one of the, it's the U.S. survey we use together. Um, uh, nutrition information, food and nutrition supplements, um, is now 2017 to 20, March 20, 20. I, um, I didn't update it because all the numbers went down a little in terms of over it. It's just like more depressing. I will say over the years, I've been looking at dietary fiber since I was you know, a graduate student, we just haven't changed much. We just haven't done that well, increasing the fiber in our diets. Um, so extension, we gotta get on this. Um, but we're, we're falling a bit short as women and um, as men, you know, quite a bit more. So there's always room for improvement. So this is where I mean, I probably got a little too sciencey, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but just wanted to let you know about protein. It's made up of amino acids, these little, we call them the building blocks of protein. And we can make some of those that are in our body, but we can't make them all. So for the ones we can't make, we need to eat them. And so I think if you grew up like I did, you know, my mom was always about, you know, if you can't finish the burger, take off the bun and eat the meat. Where all the good protein is, it's also what you pay the most for. But um, the reason is animals, you know, if you think about it, look more like us than plants do. And so their proteins and the building blocks are more like ours. And so they are, we used to call it a complete protein, we don't say that anymore. But that's why the animal sources tend to be a, uh, an easier way, I would say, to get the protein that you need um, because they look more like us. And then just to note from you know, my earlier slide, proteins just do so much in our body. I mean, they are just so vital. It's really important that we make sure that we keep our protein intake um, up. So sources, again, the animals, they look like us. And then, but then there are plant sources of protein that are, are good sources of protein. And when we eat over the course of a day and we mix these together, <coughs> they become complete, if you will. And they're also complemented if, if you do use animal products um, by, by those. And see the seafood up there. So on the next slide, this is the other part about the dietary guidelines. And so I hope it's a little bigger for you. But when you hear about, well, eat enough protein. Well, we do. Eat enough meat and poultry and eggs. So in the dark blue is, um, I believe, our like a little bit of my slide I cut off. So where the blue, light blue and blue, dark blue or lab, we're doing okay. So for females, um, we're eating about the meat that we need. Men are eating far more than they need. But then our blue dots are below the light blue on seafood, which means our what we eat is less than what's recommended. So we eat enough meat probably and eggs and chicken. You know, we don't need any more of that. But we don't eat the recommended amount of seafood. So we may be eating enough protein overall, but we're missing out on protein from seafood. And you can see we're um, pretty good on the nuts, seeds, soy products. So it's just to call out the seafood. Not only is it protein, it's got some fatty acids that are good for us. Um, and so I'll come back to this, but, okay, so this is one more. This is an older one. This is how they used to list out foods. I just always love this. But it's a ranking of protein sources. So you can see up at the top, you know, in our diet, we get mostly poultry meat, mixed dishes. You know, makes sense. But then again, bread, rolls, tortillas. Who would think of that as a protein source? It's because of the volume we eat across the U.S. They end up contributing. But then I was just making the point, the plant-based and the seafood are down at the bottom. So we get a lot of, um, less of our protein from those. I am going to try to catch my own soul up. Here. And I think why this is important, I'll come back to it at the end, is we used to in our dietary recommendations, you know, we just went very narrow, like have this much fat, you know, don't eat this kind of stuff, have this much protein. We, I think over time we've gotten much better at recognizing variety is important across all the foods. I think we've been good about that on fruits and vegetables, you know, eat a wide variety. 
But I think it applies to protein as well. Don't just say, well, I gotta have a steak. You know, you can have eggs, you can have poultry, you can have seafood, you can have legumes and beans. So the widest variety you can um, is healthy, probably because, and it's been backed up by the literature, probably also because of all the other nutrients that come along with those foods, all the other like fiber or the beneficial um, fats in um, seafood. So the last macronutrient here, um, so he's a, that's an avocado, <laughs> and he says you're fat, but you're good fat. So this, you know, we, we also used to just kind of say, you know, we eat too much fat, you should eat less, make sure it's not saturated. Um, but we're now recognizing that, no, it's, there's a variety within fat that we also should be thinking about. So again, got a little techie here in the next two slides, but fat is, it's like, I like to think of it as kind of like, when you, did you do eye chart tests when you were little, you had to like pull the fork and show which way it went. Kind of think of that fork or a comb, that's the backbone of the fatty acids. Of fats, and then there's a fatty acid that comes off of each. That's why it's called a triglyceride. And kind of like I was talking about with proteins in terms of being composed of different things, there are different fatty acids on there. So when we talk about, say, a saturated fatty acid, it might have an unsaturated fatty acid in there, but more of them are saturated. So they're not all one type or another. Those things vary, and it really gives them their characteristics. It's a little easier to look at on this one, even though that looks really um, chemistry-like. But on the top is a saturated fatty acid. So it has, it's saturated with all these hydrogens that go on the fatty acid. So that's in the blue. If you're missing a hydrogen, so you see that in the middle of the monounsaturated. It's missing one. So it's a mono one, unsaturated fatty acid, something like olive oil. And then the polyunsaturated, see the Many, there's a few places where it's missing a hydrogen. I just think it's interesting, maybe it's not important, but those are those give those things physical properties. So when you think of saturated fats, meat, they're solid. They tend to line up and make a more solid fat. Whereas the polyunsaturated don't line up so well, they're more liquidy. Um, so that would be like your oils, your plant oils. And that's true in our body. And so that's been some of the theorizing we've done about why fats have different effects in our bodies. So if it's saturated and rigid, our cells might not be as flexible like they should be. Whereas if we eat some monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, and those are in our cell membranes, it might be more fluid and be helpful. So it's not just, you know, something someone made up. It, they have physical properties, and they have them in foods, but they also have them in our bodies. And that's why we want to have you know, listen to what the recommendations are and, um, and, and um, realize they have properties. Also, I mentioned all those functions of fats. Some of those are like hormonal and they're involved in inflammation, kind of signaling around our body. Those are released from our cell membranes. So if you don't eat, you know, this variety of dietary fats, including the monos and the polys, then you don't have them in your membranes and they can't have some of the beneficial effects like in, in keeping us from having too much inflammation when they're released. So these little individual fatty acids are um, tremendously important. As I mentioned, I did fiber and lipid metabolism. So I always find this area very interesting. So in recommendations, we just say keep saturated fat on the lower end. Um, that's animal fats, tropical oils. So you know, your coconut oil, palm kernel oil, those things that are um, hard. Um, they're, they have been less expensive fats, so why they are often you all see them added in, in processed foods. Then the unsaturated are those polys, and then the monos. So those would include things like fish. So again, another reason to eat seafood, protein, healthier fats, the monounsaturated, again, those avocados, the nuts. So you can, to me, it's, it's, um, this shows how just foods cross these different categories of nutrients that we're trying to, to take in. And again, I had to do another little chart. But I, I did this one specifically because um, the mixed dishes as a source of saturated fat. Like, oh, what are mixed dishes? And so you can see they are, oh, I don't know if you can see, um, hamburgers, pizza, sandwiches. So I put this kind of slide up for us to think about. It isn't, you know, we don't eat generally, you know, just 
you know, a piece of turkey and then an avocado and then something else. We make a sandwich, we eat burgers, we eat pizza, we put things together. And sometimes those together things are the things that are contributing something to our diets that we need to be watching a little bit more carefully. I think this is a, um, maybe isn't as important for us as it is sometimes for our younger population who is eating a lot of fast food and probably getting a lot of saturated fat from that mixed category. But we have children, we have grandchildren, so we can have an influence still. So I think the last big topic that I'm covering, I should be keeping track of time here, is um, dietary patterns. So we talked for a long time in nutrition about fat, protein foods, you know, and then you do some study and you feed a bunch of this stuff and people don't do better like you thought they were going to do. And we wonder why. And I think over time what we realized is it isn't because there isn't a magic bullet, to come back to that point, it isn't about one food or one category. It's the total together. And I tell people this is why it makes studying diets really tricky. So if I want to know, is it better if I have a lot of fat in my diet or not? So my study, I put a lot of fat in one diet. I take fat out of another, but what do I replace it with? If people aren't going to lose weight, i got to replace it with something. Well, that's going to be carbohydrate or protein. Okay, now are my two groups different because of fat or carbohydrate or protein? And that's just one kind of isolated example, but that's what makes studying diets so difficult. We don't eat one thing. We eat a whole mishmash of stuff, and it's interacting, and it brings things with it that we don't even know about. What I would say is, I don't see diet, um, diet, dietary patterns that we recommend, I don't see those studied and find out that people are bad off when they follow them. So I think there is a kind of a safe bet if you want to look at a dietary pattern, if you're interested in changing. The dietary guidelines provides one, I'm going to show you a real busy chart in a minute of it, but if you go online and look at the dietary guidelines, you could take a look at that. They call it the U.S. Healthy Style Pattern. They took the U.S. diet, which wasn't completely healthy, and they like tweaked it into healthy as a way to say, you could take what you're doing now, all of you on average adults in America, or everybody two and older, and move it around. You don't have to go from this diet I'm on now, the way that I eat to this one. You can just take this one and kind of maneuver it over a little. That's why they do that one, to kind of give us a starting point. There is also a healthy vegetarian dietary pattern that they um, provide. My daughter's um, kind of a part vegetarian. She doesn't eat beef um, and pork, but then she'll order chicken nuggets. So I feel like, well, um, don't know about that. So they, they talk about a healthy vegetarian, not a, you know, what some people might consider vegetarian. Then there's two more that they don't discuss as much anymore, but you can still get online, the DASH diet and the Mediterranean diet, and I'll talk about those a little bit. So this is just, sorry, just to show you what they do in the back of the dietary guidelines. If one wanted to pick up one of their dietary patterns and look at it, they give a variety of calorie ranges for men and women, and then they show you how much of the different food groups you would need. Not real fun, but you know, it, it would work. They don't talk as much the, about the dash eating plan anymore. This was big news, boy, when I was in the um, field, you know, still a student that came out. It was one of the first, I think, studies to show we could modify a diet and have as good effect as giving somebody medication. And people were like, yes, <laughs> you can do it. So the DASH diet really focused on um, fruits and vegetables, whole grain, it was lower sodium. Um, and so you can go online and get it. And it was for reducing hypertension. And they got as good effect as people who were on medications. So I think it was just a good way to show, you know, we can't, there are things we can do for ourselves. Now I would add, my, my husband's family, um, nobody knows him here, don't tell him I talk about his family. <laughs> Lots of hypertension in his family. I mean, people get older and they just start, and, you know, I'm like looking at my kids. Look at Dad's family, watch what you eat. So, it, you know, it just starts creeping up. He had one summer kind of off on a sabbatical between two jobs. He was on hypertension medication. So he was 
We ate well, just because I make us eat well. He was exercising every day, he got huge into cycling, he was out, you know, just living the life, you know, before his next job. He could reduce his blood pressure medication, but he couldn't get off. You know, that's, when I talk about all the factors, you know, there's probably genetics in there. So, I'm not against medications, I'd rather he take one than have a stroke. So, it does show that we can do something with diet, we can do things with exercise, but we can't always take care of it all. Then the Mediterranean diet. I did like a full talk on this for extension once. And when I really looked into it, you know, it was like, well, what actually is the Mediterranean diet? If you think about the Mediterranean, <coughs> UW just sent out a, a cruise advertisement from the Alumni Association and they were going around the Mediterranean. I was like, that looks good. There's a lot of countries around the Mediterranean. They don't all eat the same. People don't eat the same in Greece as they do in Italy. So I said, okay, I'm going to pull all the studies that talk about it. I'm going to look at what they're talking about and try to get to a conclusion. So these are my conclusions for the Mediterranean diet. And I mention them because, in general, these diets, wherever they get women, tend to really have good health outcomes. I think it's really a worthwhile thing to look at. But you have to look at it and think. There's a lot of versions. You know, which version, you know, should I, would, would suit me? All of them tend to be high in plant foods. So again, the variety in protein could come from plants, your variety of fruits and vegetables, or plants. They are moderate in fish, seafood, and poultry. So our other, so no, no, you know, and high and moderate. We don't have our kind of traditional um, Wisconsin meats. Limited red meat. So they do limit red meat. They don't generally get rid of it altogether. And sweets. So very limited, those added sugars that I was talking about. They don't use processed meats, you know, oh, those brats. And they use a lot of flavor, herbs, spices, garlic, onion, generally not a lot of sodium. So you know what's looking like other things that we get recommended to eat. I think this emphasis on limiting the red meat is, is somewhat unique and really pushing, um, pushing the plants. So these are the differences I found. And I think these are natural because the foods available as these diets evolve were different country to country based on what they grow, based on what they grew up with. So whether there is a mention of fat level or not varies. So some say use low fat dairy, some just say use dairy. Some, there's more emphasis on fermented dairy than milk. So cheese, yogurt, um, quite prominent. Varies on whether they include potatoes or not. So, you know, you can think why, whether those might be grown or not. Whether they include eggs or not. Um, cereals, whether they just say high cereal diet or whether they say whole grains. I will push you towards the whole grains because you know I like my fiber. But they don't all talk about that. Whether they have avocados or, or other moms unsaturated fats. So there are some Mediterranean diets. I think people always think olive oil. You know, you just pour olive oil and everything. Not all of Mediterranean diets are big on the mom. Saturated fats. And yet, they have good uh, outcomes. I almost said alcohol because it's the next word. <laughs> alcohol, but red wine with meals. So, when you think about a lot about what we drink sometimes in Wisconsin, it's beer during the Packer game, not red wine with the meal we eat after. So, I think that probably does make a difference in terms of eating it with meals. The red wine, uh, that might just be because that's what they, they drink more than wine. I'm not sure that. But I think alcohol, you have to watch that it isn't, um, you know, excessive. And in particular, sweets or fruit as dessert. So a lot of emphasis on fruit is what you eat for dessert. But then if the, the culture has a sweet, that's often the sweet they talk about. So, you know, I was like, yay for Kringle. I mean, part of my family is German. So, you know, it would baklava, you know, for Greek. So, but limited and a big emphasis on fruit. So there's the pyramid. We don't use the um, food guide pyramid in the U.S. anymore. We haven't for a long time. Um, but some of the Mediterranean and other diets do. And you can see, so, what they have, they have a base. But what's interesting, you know, the wine is off to the side, because that's not like it's a food group. It's, you know, consume that with meals. Um, it talks, though, about drinking water. But see the big plant emphasis at that, kind of near the bottom. And then the red meat, the sweets, kind of up at the top. So they're just giving you this idea of where to go. What I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, 
Um, but I do like in this is they also talk about activity. They also talk about enjoying their food. This is, I think we've gotten better on this, but when I started in the field, um, like the U.S. Dietary Guidelines, they used to be very simple, and a lot of it was avoid, limit, you know, eat less. It was, it was kind of punitive, negative sounding. We did some focus groups when I was at Kellogg um, with the industry groups, and people were so um, attuned to this, so used to it. We said, how about if we said eat this in moderation? Oh, no, you can't say that. It's like, I'll just go overboard. Overboard. Say avoid, and maybe I'll eat it. And I just thought, that's what we did to people. We kind of got them so used to this idea of bad food, bad, 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 and, you know, good, that people didn't really know how to enjoy their food anymore. We also, at that time in our dietary guidelines, I went and looked, um, I had, this was pre, you know, lots of internet, but we had uh, people in nutrition when I was at Kellogg around the world, so I asked them all for copies of their dietary guidelines. And, you know, they have, them, they have them in other countries. <laughs> and I was struck by how many of them said, enjoy your food. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, that's not our idea. I thought, why do we think we can't say enjoy your food? Because people were telling us, I can't enjoy my food. You know, I'll eat too much of it. So I think we've gotten better over time, and I really appreciate that. And the Mediterranean one, they also talk about, you know, eat with your family, enjoy your food. And this is just all the... Studies that have been done on the Mediterranean diet, you know, it's not cause and effect. There may be other things that people in these studies are doing, but it is associated with health benefits. So I think it's, I'm not here to promote a particular diet, but I think it's one if you're interested in trying, trying would be worth it. So, well, yeah, so much stuff, but just told me, how do I pick stuff out to eat? So if you're looking for information, get trusted information. I'm, when I go on Larry Mueller's show, trusted information me here today. Look for people who have a credential. Um, I would be careful about people who are trying to sell something. If they're trying to promote a product, I mean, gosh, what do you think they're going to say about it? Um, blogs, celebrities, you know, um, one of the people I just don't care for is Dr. Oz, you know, who's out promoting stuff that you just know so little about. And um, people are like, well, he's a doctor. And then if you go to his website, I mean, he's selling things. <laughs> don't care for him. So, no offense to anybody who really enjoys this show. I don't even know if he's on anymore, but um, he's been around. Um, and then I didn't mean to press that button, but um, look for nonprofits, um, people who are authorities. Oh, thank you. Can, if you could come to my class lectures, <laughs> that'd be great. Um, so RDs, universities, scientific journals, I know that's tough. I have access to them. It's hard to get access. Um, U.S. government, CDC, USDA, FDA has great information on food safety, but also other things. And then I said nonprofit and advocacy. Later on, I thought, I'm talking about that advocacy thing. You know, the walnut industry is going to advocate for walnuts. It's not like they're so much better than pecans. But you, so you got to kind of watch that. Um, I was saying more of like the American Diabetes Association. But be careful of the food and beverage industry. I work there. <laughs> I worked hard at trying to have nutritious products and make sure what we're, it's advertising. You know, just remember, it's advertising. Personalities again. I, I just think of some of the bloggers, you know, when they're on there, they're generally younger, and beautiful, and their hair is lovely, and a lot of them, you know, they're promoting a product. If they're a celebrity, I mean, goodness gracious, what they have access to financially to, to, to look that way. That isn't just what they're saying. Their website. Um, be careful about press releases. I actually subscribe to a newsletter, um, a faculty person and his whole center that is working in the area of obesity um, puts this out. They put out a lot of things, um, but this newsletter every week with all the current articles, just a great, great way for me to keep up. And they'll put down um, the one category is headline versus study. So it'll be headline, you know, sitting on your, on your couch causes cancer. And then the study will be about a chemical in couches that was put in a cell culture, a certain cell line that you did. You know, so that's what they'll, but you know, again, you know, Jill, you work in media, I mean, you're generating the, you know, trying to grab the reader, say something simple, get them in there. But those headlines are just often, you know, not completely true. And always remember, too, when the headline comes, even when it's a good study, it's, you know, we got this much literature, and then we got this study. 
So I tell people, it's kind of like a puzzle. You know, we got all these little puzzle pieces. And you start putting the pieces in, and you're like, man, this is a beautiful sky. Oops. Oh, it's, it's the water. You know, you got to get all the pieces in before you kind of see what it is, and it can change over time. Um, so one study on its own doesn't mean much. We want to look at what everything means. So this, I think, is, I've already kind of mentioned, you know, just be careful when you're online what you're looking at. Okay, now my thoughts. Bet you thought those were all my thoughts. I got more. Um, <laughs> ignore fad diets. I mean, I just, high protein has been around since I've been in the field. It comes and it goes. It comes and it goes. Man, if it really worked, you know, it would stay, wouldn't it? I would ignore those, my advice. Eat whole foods as much as you can. So, they might be canned and frozen. Don't, you know, canned and frozen you can stay in your pantry. You can grab them out and add them to stuff. Make them check what's at, what's, uh, if there's any ingredients added to them. But fiber, okay, you know that. Read the labels. On the back or side, there'll be a nutrition facts panel. You all have seen that in an ingredient list. I worked in the food industry. Use that. All the other stuff on the label, ignore that. Some of it's true. There's regulations around making health claims. Other of it is so-so, and it's hard to distinguish between the two. So I would look at the side panel. If you see um, fiber in the ingredient list, and you look up and the amount of fiber is zero, okay, put them together. That must not my being that much of that fiber actually does. Um, variety. So in every seafood, as much as you can obtain, as much as you like, you know, I'm just, I've been trying for years. Kale, just can't do it. So <laughs> spinach though, I eat a lot of other things. So I'm, you know, I'm not gonna, I don't think go because I didn't eat kale. So if there's something you don't like, people say, well, I don't like this. Don't eat it. Don't eat it if you don't like it. If you do eat it, eat it in moderation, try to get a better variety. Watch your portion sizes. That's just kind of a, it's hard. I was just on a, I cycle online when I'm not outside with a group of people who are around the world. And it's always fun because they have accents and stuff. But you know, they were just talking in their countries in Europe how our, you know, like big gulps have gone. It's like, what is that, like a leader of cell down there? <laughs> so just keep your eye on that kind of thing. Drink water. I just think that's inexpensive, free often, not for everybody, always safe. I do want to acknowledge that, but um, good. then my tips, thoughts, tips. So um, I keep this, this and use this um, picture over and over again. When my youngest was in grade school, I said I could go to the grocery store after work, leave me on the counter, you know, your grocery list. So I enjoy it for the spelling, the potato with the E at the end. Then, you know, some of it, the specificity, not just Doritos, Doritos cool range. Oh. Yeah, we, got, we got our taste. But <laughs> I'm not quite sure why I put it all on there. I figure he thought, I'll make a huge list, maybe she'll be one. <laughs> and, you know, I would usually get, I have to say sugar or ice cream, I usually would get that for him. Although, I, we were also talking with our kids, and they were talking about eating fruit roll-ups. And I said, I don't think I ever bought fruit roll-ups. Well, when you travel for work, Dad bought them. <laughs> so plan your shopping, your meals and your snacks. That helps a lot in what, what your choices are. Another good example these days, now that our kids are not at home, one of them came home, he's an adult, he said, Mom, do you have any snacks? And I was like, no, I don't think that we do. I <laughs> said, so if you like fruit, we have fruit. So we just don't buy it is one way that we avoid things that we would, might have had now for our kids. Eat at home versus eating out. Great to eat out. It, it's a hard place to make good choices. It can be a little higher if that sodium portion sizes are big. Um, so eating at home helps us eat healthier, I think. Generally, it's been shown to be associated with healthier diets from before. Enjoy your meals. You know, this is something I struggle with. It's not that I don't enjoy my meals, but Tuning out other things, you know, I eat lunch at work and I'm eating. And then, of course, I look down and my food's gone. You know, did I even taste that? Um, so that is one behavior for me that's been that's been a real struggle. I feel a need to multitask, get things done, um, enjoy your treats. I mean, goodness gracious, 
So it's your birthday, have a piece of cake. You know, it's Christmas, let's have our cookies. I think as we deprive ourselves of things, and I don't know how much this has been shown in adults, certainly been shown with little kids. If they are told things are bad for them, they're forbidden, they can't have them, they're put on a high shelf. For kids where that's done, when they get exposed to them, it's put out on a table and they're allowed to have them, they overconsume. Because, you know, I might not get it again, so I'm going to get in there. Where, where it's not forbidden, where it's offered occasionally, understood it's part of, you know, we have a cookie after lunch or whatever, they tend to do better. And I think as adults, you know, that can happen a little bit. I've sure been at a Christmas party and it's like, I usually have this at home, you know, take it up. So um, I think just not depriving ourselves is the next slide. So this is the one slide I did add in from February to now. And it, I realized today, it kind of goes back to that first slide. So the, a big topic in the medical world is precision medicine. In the nutrition world, the NIH, who funds most of the research probably in the world on nutrition, but particularly in the U.S., just put in many, many dollars, can't even tell you how many, into a big study on precision nutrition. Have people heard these concepts? So this is, I mean, we had a whole presentation that the last in-person scientific meeting this summer. The idea is from that first slide, our dietary guidelines, we talk about what people should eat or drink, is for everybody, every healthy person, meaning not for someone perhaps with cancer or diabetes who might have a different kind of diet, but everybody, healthy adult, or every healthy person two years and above, they actually have several guidance, including now, who's year or two, two and above. Well, how personal is that? I mean, like, did that account for all those things I had in the box? No, I can tell you it doesn't. It accounts for the average person. The idea on precision, sometimes called personalized nutrition, is we are all different. We often would say that regards to genetics, you know, the blood pressure example for my husband. But we're in different environments. We have different stores that we have access to, or farmers markets. We have different amount of land in our water, maybe or are exposed to different um, pesticides or chemicals, breathe different air, um, have access to different exercise um, things. We have different amounts of money, we're different races. You know, there's all these things that likely affect our health. And so the first, um, it's kind of a series of studies that NIH is doing is they're recruiting a very diverse sample. I've asked um, how they're going to do this, and I haven't yet figured out how, because Historically, there are some groups that are likely to participate in studies more than others, and they want it diverse. Then they are going to put them on some different kinds of diets, then they're going to see how they respond kind of to a test meal. And so this is the beginnings of coming up with how do different people in different places respond. The idea being at some point they would have, uh, I guess they'd call it an algorithm, say something that could go to the doctor's office. You'd be sitting with your doctor and they'd plug it all in all of these things, and it would tell them, here's where you, how you should head them in terms of their diet. So I, I, I heard from some folks at Extension a concern about this, about is this just another nutrition or health advance that's going to prove to those people best able to access it? You know, first of all, go to your doctor, or the same doctor every time, um, those with resources to go buy the things the doctor said. So they, it's not the idea of it. I think we're just going to have to work hard to make sure it doesn't go that way. And I think within extension, there's been a lot of switch over the years, transition to looking more at policy systems and environment, we call it PSC work. So yeah, fine for me to say to you, you know, eat these fruits and vegetables. If they're not in your environment, if they're not at your store, I mean, what, what's going on? So how does this whole concept gel with changing things to enable that? behaviors and um, opportunities for everyone. So I think that's an overarching concern people have that they're watching, but you got to start somewhere. So I, I give them many kudos um, for where they're starting. But I think that I'm seeing that I, I'll be long gone, I think, by the time they figure these things out. But that's kind of the wave of the future is saying there isn't one answer for everybody. People have preferences and access. There's many ways that we might go about this. How can we help better identify who will respond or not. And so I'll give you just a final example to give you an idea of um, something I use 
sometimes in other extension talks about weight loss diets, because people are always interested in those. Um, if, uh, so I show an example of a diet. I think people were on it for six months, quite well controlled. Average weight loss, I can't remember what it was. Let's just say it was 10 pounds. So I show a graph that they have in the paper. And they have, you know, this bar showing negative weight loss. Right here in the middle is the average of the study, 10 pounds. Then they have everybody in the study. So you got people who lost 10 pounds. Then there's someone who lost um, 8, 4, 2, 1. There's people who didn't lose weight. Then there's some people who gained weight. They gained like 3 pounds. Mm -hmm. So the study comes out, hey, this is the diet of you know, weight loss. Woo! But not everybody responded the same. And so that's what precision nutrition is about, saying, you know, we come up with some average, but really everybody's different, and how do we do better in the future about recognizing those differences and helping people, um, you know, to, to have better health where they are. So that was all I had. I realized it was pretty quick, and um, I, I mean not quick, it was long, a lot of stuff. But, you know, there are a few minutes if somebody does have questions, I'd be happy to. And if you want another expert from the and I don't want to say I'm an expert, but you want somebody who knows something about a topic that you'd be interested in from the university, um, Badger Talks is the university system. Um, the nice thing about it for many groups is they pay our way, you know, they pay whatever expenses are, um, so it's free to you. Again, the university is about outreach as well, sharing our information, so please contact them if you want to get another speaker. Yes? Particular to Mediterranean diet. Um, when I have talked to my doctor this past year, when I had my our annual meet and greet, and I asked about diet, and of course got told, you know, Mediterranean diet is probably good because it's or better because it's got such a variety. So um, I of course went to the internet and looked, and oh my goodness, you get hundreds of people telling you what it is and what it isn't. Um, is the best idea to, to look through them, look for the things that you were talking about, that they're not selling something, like it's not an olive oil company that says, yeah, you did this, and by the way, use our olive oil. Um, that is one thing, but are there other tips? Boy, that's a really good question, and thank you, because I think I'll go home. <laughs> I'll look that up. Look for what a good source would be. You know, I sometimes forget because I just, you know, look at them all and look at the papers and, you know, spend a tremendous amount of work to learn one thing. Um, and that's not very practical for most people. I think the slide I had up was from Old Ways, O-L-D-W-A-Y-S. I do think they're a commercial group, so you want to be careful, but I think they have good information. That's where that pyramid came from. Um, what I will do sometimes is look for stuff from Tufts or Harvard has kind of some nice consumer information. Mayo Clinic is a good one. Um, I haven't checked for Mediterranean diet specifically, but UW Health on campus, if you Google them and then they have, you know, fact sheets and nutrition Q&As and things like that. I always, tell, I always tell people to whatever they're searching to add dot e d u and that's going to bring up things from other extensions across the nation it'll bring up um, educational sources like harvard or tufts or penn state but so instead of like whatever you're searching if you put dot e d u instead of dot com or dot org or dot gov dot gov also is a trusted source and they, so .edu or .gov, so if you just even Mediterranean, Mediterranean diet .edu and just see what comes up, but in your search engine, you have to make sure you're looking, um, yeah, the trusted sources, it's hard. Um, USDA has a Food and Nutrition Information Center, that's another one to Google, and they will link to things, they all link to extension, but they'll, you know, not every extension likes them on the Mediterranean diet. So if the Mediterranean diet's in there, they'll link to extension fact sheets that come. Yeah, I should have said extension, because they're always a good source. I'm always thinking that with like plants. Kind of see what extension says I should do about my tree. Um, 
because of the food stuff, I'm usually looking for papers. But yeah, that extension is also a great source. Thank you. It is, I mean, it, it's complicated, the Mediterranean diet. And people definitely have opinions of, you know, of course you can't have eggs on the abdomen. Other people are like, we eat eggs in our Mediterranean country all the time. So I think some of it is not just finding it. It's, if you get enough of similarities, then what works for me? Probably a, a question for you. Do you see with that like precision studies and things going that direction, like within the healthcare, do you see the need then for also like policy change around like our um, just like coverage, like access to um, for health insurance, um, like that being able to cover? Because I feel like that sounds like it would be great for someone maybe with a health condition going to their primary, but also like, you know, if just an individual wants to be more healthy, going to their primary, would that be like prophylactically covered almost? Yeah, I don't know, but definitely that is something people would like to see. Mm -hmm. Not just their physician, who a lot of physicians are good at nutrition, but like they, you know, they're covering their whole health. Being able to send people to register dietitians who could implement. Right now, I think that happens more if you're sick, you know, you've got diabetes, or you have a specific condition, then it's covered. But if I just said, well, I want to go see a registered dietitian. Now, some insurances do have um, UW Health, uh, not UW Health, the state system. You know, we we get an incentive for participating in health insurance, and that has some health coaching you can, you know, use. It has little podcasts, and I did one during <laughs> COVID on immunity and nutrition. So there are some resources like that through health care systems. But yeah, I mean, preventive care in general is just not something that is good at. I just heard someone speak on this. Health equity is another you know, topic about you know, not everybody has equal access to everything and suffers health-wise because of health disparities because of what they don't have access to. And she was just mentioning, you know, we're a very money, profit-driven country. And so if there isn't money to be made in it, it's, it's hard to get it done. And so I think that's where, you know, as we move forward and we get more evidence and we get more about how as a country this may save us money, we might be able to feed it back in. I think right now the first place I as I'm sure for her that's happening is with Medicare. Because that's the government. They're paying. I mean, it's not you and me paying our health care premiums. The government is paying for people's health and they would like older people to be to be healthier. And that's the first place where they're starting to look at a lot of the policy and who you serve and how you keep people healthy because there's a financial incentive. I think for the rest of us, you know, it's going to hopefully come over time. Might be another good talk to you. Anything else? If not, I